is the uh, second in this quarter's Design at Large talk. Uh, every talk better than the one before. We, we have we have an absolutely amazing set of speakers this quarter. Pat Handlerhan from Stanford talked uh, last week, and people showed up like this even though we had tornado warnings and rain and stuff. This morning. So, yeah. And uh, so I want to introduce uh, Fernando. Uh, and I'm trying to think of things of how to introduce him and, and how to tie things together. Uh, well, Pat, Pat was, got his PhD in biophysics uh, in Wisconsin, and, uh, and Fernando has uh, PhD in physics. So there's something good about those physics PhD folks uh, who move into other areas. Uh, and Pat had never taken a computer science course, which was also very startling thing I was able to reveal uh, in the class. And I was trying to think of what I could reveal, because I don't know Fernando nearly as well. Uh, but uh, it was 2001, take you back there, and you wrote a couple of hundred lines uh, as maybe an afternoon hack of a thing that became IPython. Uh, and, uh, and it's sort of grown a bit. Uh, since then. I mean, there's millions of people using this software. Uh, I think it's uh, not only bringing, you know, computational things to scientists in lots of different areas, but, but it's fundamentally changing, I think, for the future of scientific publication. And that we're moving beyond things just being dead bits on screens, but dynamic, interactive kinds of, of things to help people think about all kinds of things. So he's going to tell us a little bit about the design and architecture of you know, IPython, which is now on Jupyter. Uh, and, and I love his kind of thing, interactive by design. So, Fernando. Thank you, Jim, for that very kind uh, introduction and for having me here. It's a pleasure um, to, to, be, to be here. Thanks for, to all of you for coming. Um, why? Why? Why interactivity in, in this context and, and for this project? Mm, I, I often go back to this quote that I first read in the, in the staple to the, to the door of my, my first PhD advisor back in physics, in particle physics. And even though it's a very old quote for, from the 60s, uh, from, a, from a numerical analysis classic, it's probably actually more relevant today and more worrisome today than it was back then. And, and this is sort of the quote that, I, that we try to use as one of the guiding principles of this project, which is to remind us that for us, computers are tools to help us think. They are tools to help us understand problems. And everything we've done in this project is try to basically build environments and ways to help science and society use computers better to think. Um, in a very schematic and cartoonish way, the hamster wheel of, of, of computational ideas for academics probably to first order looks somewhat like this. You have, you have an idea and you're, you start playing with code, with data, with a problem that, that, that you want to explore individually. Quickly, these days, you end up needing to collaborate with colleagues. Somebody who brings complementary expertise to your own data resources for the problem. Um, at some point, if the idea has, has legs, you probably end up needing to do a larger scale production run on some other kind of hardware beyond your, just your laptop. Um, if you're successful, you'll probably want to communicate that to your community. So you want to publish that, uh, hopefully in a reproducible manner so that others can build upon it. Um, if it really is an idea that, that uh, has value, eventually it becomes part of the canon of your discipline and you teach it to the next generation. Uh, that comes in your discipline, and then you go back to one. If you write a grant proposal, and then you keep kind of spinning on the hamster wheel, right? And we think of this not as a collection of disjoint steps where you do this in, in, in one tool, and then you email scripts back and forth, and then you grab your MATLAB scripts, and you rewrite them all over again over here, and then you copy and paste bits and pieces of the figures, and you're not quite sure which version of the, of the figures you copied and pasted for the manuscript that you submitted, and then you copy and paste again for a PowerPoint. No, this should be thought of as one problem. It's the problem of computational thinking and research, and we should approach it as a coherent problem. And so when I use the word interactivity, 
what specifically do I mean by interactivity? I'm actually talking about a really, really old idea, the, the REPL. REPL is an, is an old computing acronym which stands for the read, eval, print, loop, which is what you see at the command line of any computer operating system. It's also what you see in the interactive environment, say, of a MATLAB uh, or IDL or Mathematica uh, system. It reads your input, it evaluates what you gave it, it prints the results, and it loops. That's the basic idea of interactivity that I'm talking about, and this is important for us. Why? Because I'm not talking about computing, for the most part, for, for professional software engineers who are building large-scale software to a well-defined specification of a product. I'm not talking purely about theoretical algorithm development in computer science where you're just exploring, say, the performance characteristics of one idea and algorithms. I'm talking about scientists who are working on looking at programming languages as a tool to explore a data set, to explore a question, to explore a problem. And for us, computing languages and programming languages are not pre-made, pre-molded tools. They're Lego blocks. We need to assemble them together iteratively and constantly take them apart and put them back together. So an environment where we can actually be constantly remolding things is much better than, and yes, we, it, it, there's a cost and you have to learn that vocabulary. You have to learn how to assemble the blocks, the syntax, and the, the specific features of your environment. But it is much better than a purely canned environment that knows how to do one thing and only one thing. And so in order to do this kind of work, we need to provide an, an environment that allows people to work flexibly and assemble things in this way. As Jim said, faced with two choices, I finish my dissertation or I write code that has nothing to do with it for, uh, for an afternoon or a little bit more than an afternoon. What every graduate student uh, in their sane mind does when they want to hide from their advisor is take option B, which is not work on the dissertation. Um, I, I was working in particle physics and I actually was analyzing a lot of my data with a language called IDL, which is a, a cousin to MATLAB. Um, it's an interactive uh, language that is fairly heavily used in astronomy uh, in some areas of physics, not as, much, um, not as much in other fields, not as much in engineering, but kind of conceptually a, a, a cousin of MATLAB, if you will. And I wanted to replace that with a more open stack. I actually really wanted to move my workflow to operating with open tools. And the problem was IDL had a very primitive interactive REPL. Its interactive environment was fairly limited. And somebody told me about Python. My office mate said, hey, you should learn about this Python thing. It's a language that looks really neat. And I went and looked. And it had an interactive prompt. But it was a fairly primitive one. I wanted something where I could say, run my script. And I could get a meaningful error message. And it would be syntax highlighted. And I could debug interactively. And I could CD and move around in my operating system, and I could tap complete and introspect my objects. Things that basically would put me, with the minimal amount of keystrokes, as close to the code and the data and the visualization as possible. I was building a tool for myself. And so in November 2001, at the beginning it really was just an afternoon hack. The very, very first version, which is online on GitHub, is just under 300 lines of Python. Um, and it has the basic idea. Just caching input, remembering previous results, loading a few convenience plotting routines, and giving you the very, very primitive basics of an interactive computing environment for scientific workflows that would have this. And yes, it was just a toy, but in a couple of weeks, I integrated a little bit more code from the open source community, and I had operating system access, and basically the core of the idea that grew as a popular tool in the scientific community. At that point, it's absolutely critical to acknowledge that the credit for the long-term success of the project isn't mine. If this project has had legs, it is because we've built it from day one, not as a I will be the lead PI with the lead author papers of the project, but rather from the beginning as this will be put out for the scientific community to use in the open and to build it together. And many of the people here who are core contributors to the project, Brian Granger in particular, he was a classmate of mine in physics. He's a professor in the physics department at Cal Poly, three hours north of here in San Luis Obispo. And he has worked closely with me on the project since about 2004 or 5, a few years after I started it. But 
Many of these people are, come from academia. They started using the tool as scientists. They, became, they became engaged. They started contributing. We've been able for some of them to hire them, to support them, and build it as a collaborative project. We have to acknowledge that people, uh, people do make this possible. You'll notice the absence of the federal agencies in this. There's an interesting story to be told there about how our scientific environment is supported. But the private, uh, the private funders and industry are both uh, uh, enabling, uh, enabling this project in, uh, in the large. And so after, after that basic idea of an interactive environment, Okay, that's nice. You have, you have a nice REPL, you have a nice, a nice command line environment. That's, that's useful in and of itself. What can you do beyond that? And this is where we actually began thinking about taking these questions and beginning to abstract away and design layers of abstraction that would generalize this as a platform for more problems in, com in scientific computation. And so <clears throat> Brian and I, around 2010, sat down for a session, a very interesting session where we co-designed the protocol and the implementation, writing the kernel and the server on two laptops, testing over the wire. What would it mean to take that read eval print loop that is taking your input, you type something, it executes it, and you get the answers back. What would it mean to abstract that and turn it into a generic network protocol for interactive computing? and take all of the actions that happen in an, when a human is interacting with a computer. When we looked at what all the things that IPython does, we had an example. We had, ten, at that point, nine years worth of all the features of IPython in the field. What are each of those things? And let's turn them into a messaging specification that we can abstract, put it on the wire, and put it on a protocol. The first implementation was literally less than 500 lines of code. There was no IPython in the picture. It was just a kernel and a front end talking to each other over the wire, doing the very basics just to prove that we could execute code interactively. But from that, from having that basic implementation, we got a little bit of industry support to say, once you've done that decoupling and this abstraction exists, then it's possible to create a graphical client that is now, yes, that thing looks like a terminal, but a normal terminal doesn't let you write multi-line syntax highlighted code or get a plot into a terminal. That's because this is a specialized terminal for scientific computing that was a GUI widget written in Qt that would use that protocol, not the 500 line toy, but the real version that took us now a summer to implement, uh, together with, uh, with an intern from, a com from Anthot who wrote the GUI to actually provide what would basically be a scientist's terminal, if you will, for interactive computing with embedded plots and whatnot by having taken that simple idea and abstracting it as a protocol on the wire. Once that was done, now you have a protocol. Now you have the, the piece that allows this thing to execute code over here, this thing to take your input and send it, and it's not anymore a read eval print loop. It's a take input, send input, execute, get it back. Now you've abstracted and decomposed this problem into pieces. If this client, instead of being a terminal, is a web browser, nothing changes. You, you put enough web servers and web sockets and pieces of layers of doodads in the middle, uh, as they say, every, there is no problem in CS that isn't solved by adding one more indirection layer to it. Well, there's enough of them in here to solve it. And we have an environment, the IPython notebook that we put out in 2011, that allowed you to combine text, including mathematics. The input code, now not just the one line of code, but actually multi -line, more comfortable multi-line blocks of code, their outputs. And basically, we were piggybacking on the fact that come 2011, the entire industry was at war, right? Google, Microsoft, Apple, and Mozilla were four giants of engineering pouring obscene amounts of resources into making the browser the most portable, high-performing, cross-platform graphical user interface toolkit on Earth. We didn't need to go writing that thing ourselves. We can just use theirs and piggyback on what they had done. Um, the environment that this presents is what I like to describe as literate computing. And this is in deliberate homage and reference and acknowledgement of Knuth's literate programming paradigm. But we use the word literate computing because in this environment, the emphasis is in the action of computing. It's an environment where you're working alive on code and data for a specific problem. You're not, the literate programming paradigm is about writing a, a document which can be spliced and either compiled into a document for a human to read 
or compiled into an executable for the computer to execute. Which is perfectly fine, that model is, is perfectly suitable for certain classes of questions, but the environment of a live scientist exploring a problem is a little bit different. And now, obviously, we did not invent this. Mathematica, Maple, MuPad, Sage were all environments that had done this before us. We were following in their footsteps. Um, but we tried to generalize, abstract, make it open, make the underlying format and protocol open. And we started realizing that it had to go beyond Python. This architecture that had, was executing the code in the kernel and over the wire was sending messages either to a terminal or to that Qt console that I showed you or the web notebook or any other client that somebody could write was an architecture that rapidly began being implemented instead of in Python in other languages. Because we had actually taken care of defining that protocol in a way that was abstract and generalizable. Because this is kind of a common theme that as we work on a specific problem, we try to take a step back and ask ourselves, what can we build out of this so that the solution applies to the next layer of problems that comes after? And so there were, at the time, a growing list of languages that had implemented the same back end for a different programming language. It turns out that if you go and talk to a person who's deeply embedded in the R community and you tell them that to run their R environment, they have to type Python dash dash something, they don't like that. <laughs> or if you tell the same thing to a Julia person. So it actually made sense to generalize the project and think of a way of presenting it as a general platform that wasn't specifically tied to the Python programming language. If we looked at what the project did, it had that interactive Python shell that I had shown you before, the kernel that executes Python code, which has all kinds of fancy doodads that we've added that are actually useful. Um, there are some tools for interactive parallel computing that are widely used, but that I don't have to get time to get into here. And then all of these other things, like this generic network protocol, these generic clients, the file format of these notebooks and tools to turn them into PDFs, to publish them, to collaborate with them on the web, all the things on the right are language agnostic. All the things on the left have to do with the Python language. So all we did was simply relabel and say, IPython continues existing. It's the small Python part of the project. And this project, which is about a modern architecture for computation, is Jupyter. And that's it. It's just an evolution of the project. The name is inspired. It's not an acronym, but it's inspired by the fact that Julia, Python, and R are sort of the three big open languages of data science today. Um, and it was available on the internet, so <laughs> with the misspelling, with the, with the Y spelling, it was available. Um, it's also homage to the fact that there's been a very good interplay between us, the, the world of astronomic research and scientific Python over the years. Um, and finally, it's also the fact that Galileo's original notebooks were sort of the original open publication that had all of his observations, sort of his original code and data back in 1617 with the, the Sidereal Messenger was sort of the original scientist notebook. And we've, got, we've moved so far away from that that we sort of wanted to represent that. Um, so what have we built? What ideas do we have here? If you think back to just the internet, kind of the standard internet, what are HTTP and HTML in a very, very simplistic manner? And I know that this is not doing justice to the, to the question, but very quickly, HTTP and HTML are a protocol to transfer content, it's the hypertext transport protocol, right? And a format to represent the content that is typically transported over that protocol. With those two basic ideas, we've built an amazingly sophisticated architecture of services and tools and things on, on, on the modern internet. And what we've tried to do is build, similarly, a protocol, which in our case is this a networking library called 0MQ, messages encoded as JSON packets that represent all these actions and a very specific way of connecting them. The technical details don't matter, they're well documented. And a document format to represent those interactions, which is these notebook documents where you can encode your work. And they sort of play in our mind a similar role. One defines the underlying transport of the interactions once you've specified that transport, your clients can be anything you want, your kernels can be in any language you want, but you have specified that. And then when the job is to capture a specific class of workflow, you can do that in these documents and that leads to a path. Just like 
you can interact with an HTTP server without a web client. You can interact with an HTTP server over the wire in other ways. You can also interact with this protocol in other non-notebook ways. The protocol goes deeper than that. But that's what the protocol does is it represents the REPL, right? So there's messages to read input. There are messages to ev how to evaluate and reply to the execution. There's messages to print. Here's your output. Um, and obviously, we wait on a network uh, event handler. So the loop is effectively the, the network event loop. Now, the P in REPL, what we did do is say, well, today is 2010, 2015, and we're operating in the web. So P is not just print. P should be modern display. So we defined how to represent text, how to represent figures, how to represent mathematics, how to represent interactive HTML and JavaScript. So built into the protocol is the notion that any object, any computation can represent its output in a rich manner. And the protocol specifies how outputs can do that. So that, for example, when you produce a notebook, you can have both a PNG and a PDF version of the figure so that when later, when you view it online, you're viewing the PNG version or the SVG version. When you convert it to a PDF for a publication, then you use the embedded PDF version that's stored internally in the metadata. We even have interactive widgets so that you can actually have things like interactive graphical controls written with one line of code. All I have to do is say, put at interact behind that, and then I automatically get graphical controls to do parameter exploration over my, over my code without having to write any more, any more code by hand. So the protocol itself is language agnostic, and as I said, it was inspired by Julia, Python, R, but it has been adopted by many languages. Last we checked, I think there's about 50 different implementations of the protocol in backends in many, many other programming languages. Written not by us, obviously, but by, by, the, by the community. The notebooks themselves are a sequence of cells. You type your input. Cells can have text and math. They can have code. That's where you execute code and output is produced. And very importantly, it's a very metadata rich environment. So everything, every input cell, every output cell, the, the document itself, they're all blobs of JSON with metadata attached to them. And we have built many different things that take advantage of this ability to have metadata and to read the metadata and use that metadata for different things, for instrumenting the system, for using it, for conversions, for a lot of things. The underlying document format is JSON with a publicly documented schema, uh, which means that it's a data structure. It's, it's easy to understand, and in, in the limiting case, if you need to, you can edit it by hand, but it's also a machine-readable data structure so that we can produce a PDF or HTML to view it when we want to, but under the hood, we can convert it to those formats only when we need. The underlying entity is actually a data structure that can be, that has all this metadata embedded into it so that we can do more intelligent things that only reverse engineering PDFs with it. And so it basically gives us this interactive environment with both inputs and outputs that can be used for building lots of things. So I quickly want to tell you the kinds of things that based on these core ideas, we've tried to build both within our team and with the rest of the community. So the first thing that we built in the last couple of years was something called Jupyter Hub. The notebook environment, by default, you type a command called Jupyter Notebook on your laptop and you get a a local web server running on your laptop that lets you run code on your laptop. Jupyter Hub gives you a multi-user environment where people can log in with multiple accounts. You can deploy this on a server um, and you can run it everywhere. Um, uh, in, back in the spring of 2015, a grad student at, uh, at Berkeley took this idea, working with engineers at Rackspace, did a fairly elaborate deployment with Docker and added a layer for managing homework so notebooks as homework, and to deploy homework and grade, grade homework, um, and was very successful in using it for her own teaching. She was TAing a course, and she said, I'm not grading all that stuff by hand. I'm doing it this way. So uh, faced with having to write an entire project in order not to grade a few pieces of homework, she, <laughs> she chose that option and did a spectacular job. Um, and now that same deployment is what powers data.org which is Berkeley's new Foundations of Data Science course, which is being offered now to the, to the incoming class. So the interactive online textbook uh, leads basically to one of these installations. 
we also built something called NB Viewer, which allows people to share notebooks by providing a URL. Since notebooks can be rendered, then if you want to share with a colleague a notebook and you're willing to put it on the open internet, you can just go and render it on NB Viewer and we give you just a web page. It's a static HTML page and all you have to do is send them that link. That way they can view the link and they don't have to install anything. There's a button to download it if they want to download it later. But the point is it makes it, we'll try to lower the friction for sharing technical content with plots, with equations, with text, with mathematics as, little, as low as possible. <coughs> Using these ideas a few years ago with Rob Knight, who's now here at UCSD, but back, back before he came to UCSD when he was at Colorado, we were able to show that these same tools could be used to change the culture of how computational research is done in terms of its reproducibility. So that if I publish a paper, I should be able to give you enough as a reader for you to actually take that and without spending six months or a year or two years of work, take it from there, corroborate that what I did is actually what I claim in the paper, and go from there. And that should not take a Herculean amount of effort. And so we took some, some of Rob Knight's um, uh, Chine code for uh, analysis of microbial community, um, uh, uh, microbial community data, and together with the team, with, with, uh, uh, with the IPython team, we put it on the Amazon cloud in an IPython notebook together with the IPython parallel computing tools in a parallel IPython cluster, and we parallelized the analysis. We started writing the code in the morning. I was giving a demo at four in the afternoon at an NIH workshop, and by the end of the afternoon, the code was running well enough that Rob said, oh, we should send it, this to ISMI. This is publishable. And so not only did we have that, but what we also did was say, here, when you read the paper, if you're interested, grab the notebooks and grab the Amazon machine image. And so literally boot into this paper. So grab the Amazon machine image that we used and you can go ahead and boot into the paper with the same notebooks that we used to generate a figure and take it from there. Today, the federal agencies are asking about reproducibility in research. They're asking us to share our code and data. And so this may not sound as weird today as it was, but back in 2012, people did say that you couldn't do this stuff. And I'm like, no, we could do it in a day. Um, today, Jeremy Freeman, who's a neuroscientist at Janelia Farm, has streamlined this process in a phenomenal way. He built my binder. We had a chat in the bar um, um, this spring, and we talked about the fact that by now, this should be a lot easier than the amount of effort that we had to put into building that custom Amazon machine image and whatnot. If I have a bunch of code that I want to share with you on a GitHub repo with my notebooks, I should be able to say, here, this is my GitHub repo where my notebooks live. And by the way, these are my dependencies. In order for my notebooks to run, I have to install the following tools. And I also have to have a Spark cluster attached or maybe a Postgres database or something else running to it. Make me a binder. That's what my binder is, literally. Three steps, it's one, two, three. Give the URL of a GitHub repo, specify your dependencies with a requirements.txt or an environment YAML or a Docker file if you need to go all out and actually build a raw Docker file. Add a couple services if you need, he only has support for a couple now. Click on make my binder and you get a new URL for a custom built Docker image that you can give to your colleagues. And so just like NB Viewer gave people the ability to share a notebook by giving them a URL to the rendered HTML, now Binder gives you a way to share with someone the entire computational environment with three clicks for any project. This is being used to blog, to also not just publish peer-reviewed literature, but blogs. So this is an example of a blog post written by a colleague uh, and a friend, Jake Vanderplas at the University of Washington, published in the Scientific American blog about the distribution of asteroids in the solar system and the correlation between the location of the asteroids in the solar system and their chemical properties. And so this is what you can go and read if you go to the blog. This is the notebook version. It's the exact same content. So you can read the blog post or you can download it and execute it. So the notion that scientific communication can be more informed by providing the readers the executable versions of the communication is viable not only for the peer-reviewed literature but also for things like blogs, books. So this is an example of a book called Python for Signal Processing which you can go to Amazon and order. Springer, nice expensive hardcover glossy paper, the usual Springer deal. But each chapter in that book is actually an IPython notebook. 
they're all, they were, each chapter was posted by the author who actually lives here in San Diego. Um, who works at, at a biomedical research center nearby, here near the, the campus, Jose Unpinco. Um, and he wrote each chapter as a notebook, posted it on his blog to get feedback because you can convert a notebook to a blog post very easily. And then he put the entire thing as a GitHub repository. So you can read the book in hardcover if you would like, and that's perfectly fine, and it's nice to read it that way, but you can just clone the repo and execute the book. And you don't have to wonder whether the author copy-pasted the right version before the book went to print or not. No, because each figure in the book was actually generated from the actual code. It's being used in teaching. So this is, as of the last time that we updated the list, 40-odd uh, courses that are being taught using Jupyter Hub as the Jupyter Notebooks as the, the content delivery system or Jupyter Hub as the platform or both. Um, and now there's a dedicated education mailing list for Jupyter where people discuss questions about education on the project. Um, as I mentioned to you, Data, Data 8, the course at Berkeley um, uh, that was started the last fall for the new data science uh, educational initiative on campus is using uh, this. So this is, if you go to the website, this is the book. Um, and each chapter in the book eventually will get you to points where you have to click on, you can click if you want to on interact. Every time you click on interact, you get taken, if you have, if you're enrolled in the course, you can log into your Jupyter Hub instance with the, the interactive notebooks that basically back the static content of the book. Um, it's also, these platforms are being used for MOOCs, so Lorena Barba, who's an engineer at George Washington, has developed on Open edX a MOOC that is fully developed Using, uh, using notebooks as well. And Lorena will be spending her, um, her spring sabbatical um, at, at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science working with me. She's a fantastic educator. Um, and all of, all of her materials are on, on, on GitHub. Well, I have a typo there. It's GitHub, not Git, GitHub. Um, and she also did the work of building the necessary platform components on the open edX code to make it possible to do this kind of deployment. There are books about how to use the system. There's a couple of books about how to basically use the system for data science, which themselves do come with, um, with notebooks for the readers. Um, but we've also tried to work with the high profile publishers to show that yes, this is a viable way of changing the way in which we present the scientific literature to, 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 to the community. So um, at the end of uh, 2014, we worked with Nature on uh, a feature about uh, the system as a way of collaborating um, and sharing code for scientific publications. But in particular, we added, if you, go, if you go to this, if you go to this URL, if you simply Google IPython Nature, uh, it'll take you here. You can click and go to a demo notebook, which is actually one of these hosted notebooks in the cloud that we provide that contains both text, code, and these interactive sliders for you to play with to demonstrate that publishers, even publishers such as Nature, can potentially host. In this case, the examples were a little bit toy examples, a couple of small plots, and the, an example of using scikit-image to do thresholding on the Hubble Deep Field image, which is a, an open, openly available, um, an openly licensed image in astronomy. But the point is, this is scientifically realistic code and data hosted by a publisher, being executed and accessible as, as part of the scientific literature. So hopefully, we can, we've demonstrated that it is possible to approach this and begin changing the conversation about how scientific publication works. We have a system that allows people basically to build a scientific workflow where they may have their data sources that are coming from files on disk that may be CSV or Excel files. They may, have, they may be pulling in from databases. <coughs> and by encoding, the, um, the workflow of the working scientist and providing them with an environment where all of that is encoded in this format for which then we have tools that have, that have very flexible export capabilities, then scientists can, or whoever's working with this because it also is used widely in industry, um, can then produce the necessary output for whatever specific domain and community is needed. Um, so in research, the workflow of literate computing becomes explore your ideas interactively. At some point, you probably want to distill the pieces of that work that are becoming permanent, persistent libraries into something else. We're not claiming that this replaces programming in other ways. We're not claiming that this is the only tool that computing, 
that's, that, that computing in science is ever going to need. Because there are times when in your interactive exploratory workflow, you abstract out and distill reusable components. And we actually are working on ways of finding how can we semi-automate the extraction of that and how can we blend in the process. But it's important to remember that the part of building reusable components uh, out of your in interactive explorations uh, is something that you may need to do. But otherwise, your collaboration uh, can be done in the notebooks. You can <coughs> share this output and then you can accompany basically your papers with a full record of how every result was actually obtained. Um, I can't go, there's no time for me to go into sort of many, many examples. We actually maintain a gallery on our wiki of examples of links of content and interesting scientific material that has, or and actually non-scientific too, kind, kind of interesting material that has been created with these tools of, you know, of many different types. Um, in particular, this is an example of the section on reproducible academic publications, which to me matters a lot because I'm interested specifically in science. Um, and these, these ideas that, that we thought about as actually just operating from how do we clean and sort of abstract and integrate the everyday workflow of a scientist typing at the command line and trying to just look at their data, right, have actually become infrastructure. So this past summer, in the span of uh, probably a month or two, uh, a few weeks, um, Microsoft announced that on their Azure cloud platform, the Azure ML platform, which is the machine learning platform from, uh, from Microsoft, they were now officially supporting notebooks as part of the environment for data analysis in the Azure cloud as an official Microsoft product. Um, IBM, roughly around the same time, launched the Data Scientist Workbench, which is on the IBM cloud, basically Jupyter Notebooks hosted on the IBM cloud with their own enhancements and their own access to data and other resources from IBM. Um, and then in October, Google launched the Google Cloud Data Lab, which is, again, hosted, this is the notebook, this is the, the notebook, but with its own customizations to tie into Google's own infrastructure and the Google data APIs and access to the Google resources. So these are companies that are now building infrastructure. And Microsoft has funded our work, Google has funded our work. IBM is actu actually has several teams that are collaborating with us and contributing back to the open source project in a very regular way. Bloomberg, um, from Michael Bloomberg in New York, has been uh, developing They've been contributing to the project for the last couple of years uh, very, very deeply in the development of this, the interactive machinery for all of these interactive control widgets. And they've released as open source data, now, uh, data visualization library that is built on top of this architecture where you can have data visualization tools that actually have event handlers on the client in JavaScript that are connected back to the kernel so that you can basically draw the line between what you do client side in JavaScript and when do you send event ba events back to the kernel to do heavy duty computation back in whatever your kernel is. And that kernel could be running in a supercomputer, it could be running in a very high end machine, right? Um, and you can draw that boundary flexibly, right? It, we do, yes, browsers have become very fast, I know that. Yes, I know we have WebGL and I know that the modern JavaScript engines are very good. But you're never going to move all the data into the pipe that goes to the client always. That's not always going to be viable. What, what we need is a tool that allows you to specify what parts of the representation of the computation of your problem need to exist in the client, what parts need to exist in where, where, where your potentially gigabytes or terabytes or petabytes of data are sitting, and where do you flexibly draw those boundaries. And BQplot is a really nice example of a library, of an open source library built by Bloomberg on top of this architecture. Um, O'Reilly in May, announced that they were adopting Jupyter Notebooks basically as the foundation of content delivery um, at O'Reilly, the, the company that, that writes all the nice animal books that we all love. Uh, and this came out of some really nice work that we did with them, a great collaboration with a team, with a technical team at O'Reilly. They have a platform called Atlas, which is O'Reilly's own platform for authors to create content. If you're writing content for O'Reilly, whether it's a book or a blog post or you would write it in Atlas, which is effectively a fancy content management system with version control that can produce HTML output, PDF output, books, and it's integrated with their editorial workflow and their stores and everything. And so what they did was integrate it so that authors could author their content. Now this is not notebooks. This is content of any kind, right? 
Somebody's writing a book, somebody's writing a blog post, a web page for O'Reilly, who knows? But stripping out the notebook and leaving just the underlying protocol, that author might say, I'm writing a web page and I need an R kernel with the following dependencies on this data set because that's what I want to show in my example. So they abstracted that into a library that lets you create a Docker container only with the dependencies that the author needs. And then the author can specify the input code that they want and every cell has a little run button so that any page can have a run me right here button that will execute that code in the Docker environment with the dependencies and data that the author specified and it actually executes. So this is not a notebook anymore. Again, it's this notion of trying to take these ideas and abstracting them into decomposable blocks. Um, this project is called Phoebe. It's a, and it's, under, it's not under our organization. If you go to GitHub, you'll find Phoebe under the O'Reilly organization. And it's basically kernels cleaned up and abstracted as a service. Um, with Bloomberg, we're working on a large refactor of the actual user interface of the notebook, which is kind of a, a little bit of a scary HCI project if you think about it, because this is a user interface that is very widely used. And we're actually refactoring it in order to make it much more modular because we do know that there are things that we are never going to do for everybody. And we don't want to be the ones having to implement everything for everyone. And so we're doing a refactor to make a tiled layout interface that makes it much easier for people to add their own components into the system that are still talking to the underlying architecture, that are still exchanging messages with the back end, but where others can add and customize the environment in the ways they need. And Bloomberg has done a lot of the, Bloomberg and Continuum Analytics uh, have done a lot of the, the underlying development, the technical development, uh, and we're working with them. Uh, <coughs> in terms of sharing and collaboration, um, obviously the place where people put most of their code these days is on GitHub. Right? We make it possible for you to share a notebook with your colleagues by putting it on your website, rendering it with, our, with a URL, and sending them our NB Viewer URL. But most people just put stuff on GitHub. Right? And this is what a notebook used to look like on GitHub. You would go to GitHub, click on a notebook, and you would see a bunch of JSON because that's what they are. Notebooks are data structures, right? raw JSON. As of May 2015, this is what you see. So we worked with the team at GitHub so that notebooks would be rendered natively at GitHub. And so now when you go to GitHub, every single notebook, no matter what language it's implemented in of those 50 languages and counting that we have, is natively rendered. So it makes it much more natural for people to create content. And when it opened up, there were order 200,000 notebooks. That statistic is old, it probably has grown. Um, this was a great collaboration with the, the team at GitHub. Now that notebooks are recognized as a core data type in the GitHub architecture, we can track trends, we can do statistics, we can understand how is the large scientific and software development community using these tools in general. Back, uh, back before Jill Messeroff, who is here at UCSD now, but back before she had come here, um, Oh, but uh, what, I, what I mean, I'll repeat the question, why, why is it easier that they're recognized? Because uh, now I can ask GitHub, what are the trending notebooks for the month? I don't have access to that if I'm mining it from the outside. That relies on them treating this as a first class entity. And that's what became possible once they adopted, they accepted this as a first class entity. Individual operations on individual notebooks, obviously we can do from the outside, but understanding what is happening at GitHub with all this content is only possible once, it, once they become part of their infrastructure. So when Jill Messerov was uh, at the Broad Institute, we collaborated on the integration between her gene pattern project and IPython. And now this morning, actually, I saw a demo of what's called now the gene pattern notebook, which is basically an extension um, an extension of, and a customization of, I wish I had a screenshot, but I literally saw the demo for the first time this morning, um, an extension and a customization of the gene pattern project for genomics with dedicated custom extensions for analysis in the notebook that her team has been developing. And so she continued after she moved, the original uh, release happened uh, before she moved here in February, but, but her team has continued, um, has continued building this development. Um, 
And finally, uh, as, a, uh, as part of the PRP project, which is led, uh, which is led here by, uh, by Larry Smarr, uh, we've been collaborating with folks in his team on how to take some of the nodes that are put in the Pacific Research Platform, which is this very high-end network <coughs> excuse me, system to connect research universities in the West Coast, how to put in some of the end nodes, these uh, high-end Fiona nodes, how to add Jupyter Hub as the interface that precisely allows scientists to come into the research endpoint and operate with this on all of the data that, that is being made available over the network. Um, and we just had a meeting about some of the details and I think a, a new Jupyter incubation project is going to emerge out of that uh, to basically couple Jupyter Hub not only to operate on the end node, which is called this Fiona node, which is basically a very, very high-end machine with extremely high bandwidth networking and GPUs, but also how to connect it to potentially the supercomputing resources that may be sitting in the nearby supercomputing supercomput center and how to add basically scheduling so that I can say, oh, maybe this job, I actually, no matter how good this thing is, I actually need it to run on, on the bigger iron, the 100,000 core larger machine there. Let me see all of those resources seamlessly through the same interface. Um, and finally, we've sort of opened up European offices um, because uh, a few months ago, a new project started and uh, funded by the EU. It's a four-year project, about, a little, uh, uh, about 8 million euros, called Open Dream Kit, which is a project to build envir um, en environments for open source mathematical research and education. And we have a team of three PIs, one, two in England uh, and one in Norway, who are part of the, of, um, of the project. And two of my former team members have moved, moved to Europe and are working there in addition to the new people that, that they are hiring. So this is now part of sort of building open source infrastructure for mathematical research in Europe. So I hope that I've been able to, A, stay on the clock, which I have, and, uh, and B, convince you that by trying to think about actually the everyday workflow that we follow as scientists and as educators, the things we do, right? We need to run code, we, need, we want a tab complete, we want to create a figure, we need to write a paper, we need to collaborate with others. By trying to think about all of those actual everyday problems of the real computing that we do as scientists in physics and biology, I happen to be an ex-physicist, I guess. Um, Thomas Kloiber, who I just mentioned in my team, is a plant biologist. Um, Jessica Hamrick, uh, who wrote that fantastic system. She's a PhD student in cognitive science. She works with Tom Griffiths at UC Berkeley. So in whatever our specific domain is, by trying to look at those questions and just taking the time to take a step back and saying, can we implement a version of that that is a little bit cleaner, a little bit more abstract, a little bit more generalizable, and we do it in an open community way, we can actually build tools that have a much larger impact, whether it's for high-end research or for open education, for changing publication models, or for interacting with industry. And I hope, I hope that this is useful. Thanks for your attention. Okay, um, sure, please. Uh, yeah, so how do you approach uh, I Spark notebook and I Spark? Yes. And there are, is I Spark notebook and there is Databricks, but I don't understand if there's, if this is stable or what, what's going on. So Databricks has its own product, which we have nothing to do with, and it's a commercial product. Um, I actually can honestly say that I don't know how it's implemented. I haven't seen the underlying implementation. We have been collaborating actually with teams both at Microsoft and IBM on the open Spark support in here. So the IBM team that I mentioned earlier, they are the creators, that's the emerging technologies team at IBM. They are the authors of the Spark kernel for Jupyter. And we've been collaborating both with them and with the team at Microsoft on smoothing out that integration. So we actually do maintain, do, I mean, we didn't author the kernel, but we collaborate closely with the teams who created it. And for us, Good Spark integration is a pretty high priority. We actually have a student at Cal Poly working on that. And if you have specific issues or problems, I'd be happy to talk to you because providing good, good clean Spark integration is pretty high priority for us. It's, it's kind of, it's one of the high, the, the ones we, we didn't author, but it's one of the ones we actually care about. Question? Thinking about grading. Grading. Go ahead. So uh, the first question is, 
what was the nature of the assignments in that Berkeley course? Were they programming assignments? Uh, have you seen other examples of this? And second, what do you have any comments on what was the instructor effort in sort of creating the tools for automated trading and what did they really have to provide? And did they have any, any uh, needs around that? Sure. So the content of the course was uh, called um, Computational Models of, Co of Cognition. So it was basically a course on, on statistical models of the brain, if you will. And the assignments were fairly compute intensive. In previous years, which Jess had taught, they had been given basically as a PDF handout of the problem set and potentially some MATLAB scripts that might be the start of the solution or maybe a couple of utility functions. And the students had to turn in more MATLAB scripts. And that was it. Right? And the change, which was a ton of work because she built together with Brian Granger because Brian was also teaching at Cal Poly. They were the, they were the two leads behind this, even though others have contributed. They built the grading system and, the, and the, the homework management system to basically deliver, put homeworks and submit homeworks so the students can get new, new homework assignments, finish them, and then basically submit them back. Um, and then a system to, that was a fair amount of work, but what it provides is a combination of, remember I said there's a lot of metadata everywhere? That's what we, it uses. So the idea is the instructor can go through as they're creating an, uh, an assignment, which is now a notebook, that can contain theory, mathematics, links, equations, code that does work and they can test right there, pieces that the students need to write. They can annotate with the metadata flags, they can annotate what is a problem that needs to be, that can be auto-graded, how to auto-grade it, how many points does it take? What is a problem that requires manual grading? Because there's places where you do actually need it, fee, in, manual input. And the system will automatically do what you've told it to do automatically, leave the remainder for a human instructor-driven input, but simplify it so that when you have 220 students, which is what Jessica was faced with, she doesn't have to go through 220 emails and unzip 220 zip files and God knows what, but instead there's kind of a quick, rapid interface where she can go type in her feedback for the non-autograded non portions, provide the feedback, and have all that information go into the great database automatically. So that, that was the work. It's, it, from, I'm not teaching right now, so I haven't used it, but from both Jess and Brian, what I hear is that it does simplify things quite a bit. Doug Blank at Bryn Mawr is also using it, and a few others on the list. What I'm interested in is how someone with a background in particle physics goes on to create something so foundational, something that can be used in so many platforms in, in other fields. Do you think your background in physics helps you give a foundational understanding of something that can be used in so many different ways? That's a, that's a very hard question to ask in an unbiased manner because <laughs> particle physicists are famous for having the worst of the hubris of physicists. So you're kind of goading me into giving the worst possible answer that I could give on the record. And so instead I'm going to take the slightly safer answer and say, look, we have plant biologists, we have cognitive scientists, we have other people on the team who are also, and these days they are the ones doing all the hard work, not me. Uh, so, so I would like to think that that's not the case. I would like to think that it's not only physics, but there may be an element to it. It is true that theoretical, uh, the, the training of a theoretical physicist does provide an element of abstraction over the world of thinking abstractly and trying to look at nature in, in looking for patterns that you can generalize. Um, maybe that did help a little bit. I don't know. But many other people have done better work than mine. So it, I'm not going to try to make a general statement over my own arrogance as a particle physicist. Larry. Well, <coughs> Tim Berners-Lee was at CERN when you did <laughs> Maybe there's a pattern. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go there. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, Microsoft introduced uh, inter uh, operating uh, office with this. So in other words, we can take stuff from Word or Excel and, and you know, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's kind of got an operating environment. They have an office environment. Is, are they interested in that? Not yet. There is nothing with Office. Uh, what we've done with Microsoft is interoperability with Visual Studio, mm -hmm. which is a kind of a more obvious starting point. So the relationship with Microsoft began around 2010 when we actually showed them that original QT console and described the protocol in literally a one afternoon meeting with people in the Visual Studio team uh, where we explain how the code worked 
led to them disappearing. And we thought, oh, well, well, these big companies, you never know. They come to a meeting and then they go away and you never hear from them. Nine months later, Microsoft open sourced, it's called PTVS, Python Tools for Visual Studio, which is a fantastic plugin if you're on Windows. It's an extraordinarily good plugin for using all of the machinery in Visual Studio and adding Python tools for de de debugging and whatnot. It can, do, it can do things that only Visual Studio can do, like debug across the stack between Python and C using the, the Visual Studio debugger inside of the C frames of the stack, which is really useful and nothing else out there can do that. Uh, and they added an interactive REPL and they added a, a graphical terminal written in the Visual Studio Toolkit. So that was not our. It's not like they took our Qt thing and rammed it into Visual Studio because Visual Studio is written in its own thing. They took the protocol and they implemented it so that within Visual Studio you would have that. So that's as far so as it has gone with them in terms of putting it here or deploying the notebooks themselves in their cloud machine learning platform. The question of integration in Office is obviously a tempting one. I'm not privy to what happens inside of Redmond, so I don't know. But nothing public has come out of that is, is all I know, and so I, I don't know. But it's obviously a very interesting question of having a, an everyday authoring environment, have it speak that protocol, have it talk. It has crossed my mind. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I, I do. I think working with the funding agencies, working with the publishers, working with the right publishers. I mean, I haven't had the bandwidth to do to do all of it, but we've had conversations with. I mean, Nature has actually been surprisingly the the the, the Nature Group has been really surprisingly interested in open, um, and and has had a long series of articles about reproducibility and data sharing and code quality and whatnot. That that they've been really a great partner for this, but also working with things like PLOS and eLife and PeerJ and other journals in basically trying to move the dialogue. So much of the academic cycle of incentives hinges on what happens around publications that w pushing deeper there um, honestly is very high on my priority list but not high enough to actually get done it, it, it's <laughs> right sub threshold in that like I really care about it but it just never gets done but I, I have had conversation with plus labs with peer J with a bunch of others but we never go beyond the wow we should do so much more with this and what next Well, thank you very much. I'm happy to have a chat one-on-one -on -one if anybody has any more questions for a few minutes. But I really appreciate your patience and attention. And thanks again for the invitation.